I haven't made it a secret that the Lost Mine of Thandelver in the starter set here is my favorite 5e adventure. So, I was thrilled when they announced that they were expanding it into a full level 1 to 12 hardcover book. And many thanks to Wizards of the Coast for sending them our way to review. Expectations were really high on this one, and uh, I do have some thoughts. So there will be spoilers ahead, so if you want my spoiler-free final thoughts, jump to the conclusion sections using that little segment of timeline down there below me. So let's dig right into Fandelver and below the Shattered Obelisk. Today's video is brought to you by Hitpoint Press. The Imperfect Sale is going on now. Get Imperfect Animated Spell Decks, Condition Decks, the Deck of Illusions, and the Humblewood Book or Box Set today for a massive discount. Supplies are limited, so be sure to check it out now using the info icon in the corner or the links below. The Shattered Obelisk takes the original Lost Mine of Fendover adventure from the first D&D starter set over here and reproduces it here largely unchanged. A few things have been updated, including some mostly cosmetic NPC changes, a gender swap here and a race swap there, and several very welcome new art pieces, including Sildar Hallwinter, Clark the Bugbear, Harbin Wester, one of my favorites, uh, Lenine Greywind, Glassstaff, Radoth the Druid, and several others, but you're mostly getting the same adventure with only two notable differences. First, the Starter Kit Adventure included a lot more information about how to actually play the game. It really walked you through, step by step, your first combat and skill checks and things like that. This adventure largely dispenses with most of that hand-holding, but it still feels like a beginner adventure. The Starter Box had a separate little how to play game manual as well, but you can use the free Basic Rules PDF on their website, which we'll link down below if you do need that. Secondly, it includes some new mutated goblins that tease the upcoming new part of the story to come. I know there's a lot of conversation out there about the changes to the first part of the story, but I don't find that conversation particularly interesting or helpful. It's that second half of the story that I'm here for, and I was a little disappointed. The new half of the story involves the titular Shattered Obelisk. It seems a trio of Mind Flayers are using some minions to try to scavenge pieces of an ancient arcane obelisk, and once they gather enough of the pieces, they're going to use it to turn everyone in Phandalin into Mind Flayers. This translates into gameplay as a series of dungeon crawls and fetch quests. A lot of dungeon crawls and fetch quests. You'll be going to an old Duragar mining outpost, a subterranean temple, to the Dwarven guard, God of Buried Secrets, the forgotten crypt under that temple, uh, an underdark settlement where Drow and Duragar and Sharp Neblin used to coexist, and then another big underdark stronghold before you finally reach the climax of the adventure, which takes place in the Far Realm, and that is definitely the highlight of this adventure, at least for me. All the individual pieces are perfectly fine. Each little dungeon is interesting in a class D&D &D kind of way. You get to face a lot of the classic creatures and lots of fun apparitions and variations on mind flayers later in the adventure. But to me, it all kind of feels samey. There's nothing really groundbreaking here. Not much that your players haven't done before, uh, with the exception of that final chapter that finds you in the actual Far Realm. I'm looking for a few things in my D&D adventures these days. I want to experience something with my players that they haven't done before. Kingmaker in Pathfinder lets them found and run a kingdom of their own. Horizons of the Vast in Starfinder lets them found and run their own colony on an alien planet. Call of the Netherdeep features a rival adventuring party to keep your group on their toes. Descend into Avernus has them in hell, putting on their own version of Mad Max Fury Road with their own customizable hell machine. But I don't think Fendover here really brings much innovation. But I think this is still a good first adventure for new DMs, especially if they want that classic D&D feel. I do rather lament that they removed some of the early guidance though, because of that I might still point people to the starter set here, especially if they're just brand new to the hobby. If they're somewhat familiar with how the game works, I think Fendover here will be completely fine. There are a couple of things that I think D&D &D adventures like this one kind of struggle with, but there are things that you can do to fix those problems. The books rarely give your characters a lot of reasons to actually go on the adventure or to feel invested in what's going on. It is up to you as a DM to build that into the story. This adventure has a bit in common with Dragonlance. It all starts in a little village, and the more your group cares about the village, in this case Phandalin, the better your adventure is going to be for you and your party. 
Luckily, the entire first half of the adventure takes place there in Phandalin, and you'll return there pretty frequently in the second half as well. But I do think you need to do some work to have your characters lay down roots in the city. The game recommends that when the adventure starts, it's your character's first visit to the city, and I think that is a good idea here. But you may want to have them start with friends or colleagues or family already present in Phandalin, or have them see the city as a fresh start. It's kind of a frontier town that just discovered the Faerun version of gold and in their hills. So it's a good place for a characters to get a fresh start. I think you should consider having them get houses or a base of operations there or open a business or develop relationships with the many NPCs that the book supplies and create some of your own. Spend time developing the NPCs and seeing who your party latches onto. This is an adventure that would benefit from you keeping a spreadsheet of all the local NPCs because you'll want there to be a lot of them. This needs to be your star's hollow filled with eclectic, lovable townsfolk. The more they care about the town of Phandalin and all the people in it, the more invested they'll be when the town starts to get corrupted by those far-realm forces from the obelisk. The motivation the book provides for the characters going after the Mind Flayers is the kidnapping of quite a few of the Phandalin NPCs. And this one's, in this case, a lot of them that don't really have much of a presence in the beginning of the adventure. So if they turn out to be NPCs that you have developed in your story, you're gonna be in better hands for the last half of the adventure. I do think there are some fun things that you can do with internal stories in the town too that aren't super present in the book. While the town master Harbin Wester is painted in a slightly more favorable light here than he was in the original adventure over here, I think there's still room for conflict there. Uh, in my run, we actually ended up having an election because one of the NPCs, one of my PCs was a noble and he thought he could run the town better than Harbin was running it. You also have Halia Thornton who was nominally trying to take over the town for the Zentara though there's nothing really in the adventure progressing that particular story. So I think you could have an internal Phandalin subplot that pits Holly Thornton for the Zentarum versus the established town master Harbin Wester versus perhaps your characters or a leader from the town of their choosing that could give you another opportunity to develop the town and your characters' connections to it. One disappointment I had in this story is that the Mind Flayer subplot didn't organically grow out of the Phandalin story. It feels like a separate adventure that they just pasted onto the end of the starter box story. The Lost Mine of Fendelver has an interesting story of its own uh, as a place where the humans and dwarves and gnomes came together 500 years ago to make use of the so-called forge of spells that allowed them to craft powerful magical items in that mine. And I think the writers could have used that forge of spells as a jumping off point for a story that would have felt more cohesive, perhaps. Otherwise, I think I would do more to seed the mind flayers into the first half of the story rather than just having those mutated goblins running around. Instead of bandits rolling through the lost mine of Fendelver 500 years ago, maybe it was the mind flayers and see that idea that once a long time ago, the mind flayers controlled this area. There are parts of the obelisk and various parts of Phandalin. So make sure that the PCs get a chance to see them. This little kind of shattered things that are spread around the story. They mentioned them in here. So make sure you call attention to those in some way and do as much as you can to make sure you just foreshadow what's to come in the latter half of the adventure. But the Mind Flayer story does have some good things going for it as well. If you're luring in new players from Baldur's Gate 3, having a Mind Flayer centric story is probably going to entice them. Also, the Mind Flayers are just great foes that haven't been utilized much over the last few years. And the opportunity to visit the Far Realm is just fantastic. And like I said, that last chapter in the Far Realm is the best part of the book. You'll bounce between several different floating islands that all have a very different feel and different story to tell. It's one of those setups where you're super excited to keep playing because the next island could have almost literally anything on it, and that's just a lot of fun. The other thing that just really bugs me about these professional adventures lately is that there isn't any discernible theme or deeper level of meaning. It is a, it is a straightforward narrative centered around a bunch of mind players trying to take over a town. There's no underlying commentary, allegory, or emotional engagement. And that's fine for a lot of folks, but to me it just feels like the early days of video games where games were just games and not much more than that. These days video games attempt to leave an impression like the best movies and books do. Games like Bioshock and Disco Elite and Papers, Please, and What Remains of Edith Finch, and The Last of Us. The list, is, the list goes on and on these days. And I feel like most published TTRPG adventures, especially in 5e, don't strive to work on that level, and it makes me a little bit sad. There are certainly exceptions, and if you have some that you recommend, please let me know down below. 
As far as Fendelver and below odds and ends go, you get around 15 new stat blocks, heavily focused on aberrations. There are two new Mind Flayer types, the CR11 Clairvoyant, who trades in their connection with the Elder Brain for a direct connection to the Far Realm, and the CR8 Prophet, who has very acute senses and stronger psionic abilities. You also get a new Alhoun stat block. Uh, the highest CR new stat block in the book is a Refraction of Ilvash, which is an aspect of a Mind Flayer God. There are quite a few encounters that make good use out of some of the minis that we've gotten over the past couple of years. There's an encounter with a young Amethyst Dragon with its own new stat block, and there is a young Amethyst Dragon mini in the Fizban set. There's also an underwater fight with a purple worm. There's a battle with an Elder Brain. Uh, another thing I was happy to see at the end was a little more fleshed out information about how you could continue the story of this uh, adventure if you wanted to continue on past the end of the actual written adventure. And that's one thing that Pathfinder and Starfinder have traditionally always done a little bit better than D&D, but they put a little bit more effort into it here if you want to continue past level 12. So anyway, final thoughts, final spoiler-free thoughts. This isn't exactly what I wanted with a full Fandolin adventure, but I think there are folks out there who will enjoy it. If you're wanting a classic, straightforward starter adventure that has a lot of dungeon crawls, where you fight a lot of classic D&D creatures, you're going to enjoy this. It is a combat-heavy adventure that doesn't bring a lot of new things to the table, but that's fine for a group's first or second adventure, perhaps. What is here is well done, and I don't think it's necessarily going to knock anyone's socks off, though. I think the more you do in the Fandolin setting before the beginning of the second half of the adventure, the better your experience is going to be. This isn't going to be an adventure I'll be running personally, aside from the final chapter that wasn't really much that excited me, but it's all a matter of taste, really. If you're absolutely brand new to D&D or you're getting a gift for someone who is, I think the starter set over here might be a better fit. It's designed to be more for beginners with more help, but as they work their way through it, they can easily pivot to almost any other 5e adventure depending on what that particular group enjoys. The best thing about the Fandolin level 1-4 to four adventure is that it is an easy jumping off point for so many other stories. I used it to go to Storm King's Thunder, as you can see in my tips for running Storm King's Thunder video up there, but you could just as easily go off into Descend into Avernus, or Tyranny of Dragons, or Icewind Dale, or even something like Curse of Strahd. I mean, you can certainly do that with this book as well. The two halves of the story are pretty disconnected connected, honestly. If you have a group of players around level four or five and they have a little town that they've been working in, you can easily just take this book and run the second half of the adventure with the Mind Flayers if you want to. While the modularity of some of these D&D adventures can lead to some consistency issues like you see here, I do kind of like being able to mix and match different pieces to make my own adventure. Fendelver and Below, the Shattered Obelisk, will be releasing on September 19th. You can get the Physical and D&D Beyond bundle for about 60 bucks, the Physical book alone for between 50 and 60 bucks, and the D&D Beyond version alone for between 25 and 30 bucks, depending on if the pre-order sale is still going on. You might want to go check that soon. And of course, the Special Edition cover, which you can see right here, is available exclusively in game stores. We should have some exclusive maybe news on the Fendelver mini collection from WizKids pretty soon here, so be sure you're subscribed to the channel to check that out. There will be a limited edition, edition box set again, which we'll be receiving hopefully by the end of the month, and then it'll be hitting retail in November. The full booster set is expected in January, along with a new Hydra mini. Did I mention you also fight a Hydra in this adventure? Like I said, it is a very much of a classic hits adventure. And don't forget to check out the Hit Point Press in Perfect Sale to do some early holiday shopping for some fantastic deals. If you have questions about the adventure, please do let me know in the comments. I'm also going to be trying to do some TikTok lives in the evenings this week or next week, sometime soon. So if you want to check, you can find me over there as well. You can come and chat with me, ask whatever questions you have. Uh, or you can find me on one of these platforms over here. So yeah, thank you for watching today. Uh, until next time, please stay safe, have fun, love each other, and I will see you next time at the Gallant Goblin. Goblin.